Evet, herkese iyi akşamlar. Sesimi duyabiliyor musunuz? İyi akşamlar, i̇yi akşamlar hocam, duyuyorum. İyi akşamlar, iyi akşamlar. Rektör hocamızı bekliyoruz. Bir, üç, beş dakika bekleyelim. Haber alamazsak tekrar soruşturup ona göre bilgi verip programımıza başlarız diye düşünüyorum. Şimdilik... Ee, arkamıza yaslanıp bekleyelim lütfen.
Birazdan başlayacağız arkadaşlar. Evet, hocamız sorumuza katıldılar. Tekrar bir düşme oldu gibi geldi bana. Evet. Evet, Sayın Rektörüm, kıymetli izleyenlerimiz, kıymetli misafirlerimiz, ULISA, Ankara Yıldırım Beyazıt Üniversitesi Uluslararası İlişkiler ve Stratejik Araştırmalar Enstitümüzün yeni bir webinarına, online seminerine hoş geldiniz. Bu akşamki konumuz Bosna'da neler oluyor? Bosna'da biliyorsunuz çok kısa zaman içerisinde gerçi e, Temmuz 2021'e kadar giden e, başlangıcı bir e, kriz durumu söz konusu şu anda. Biz bu krizin e, e, neden çıktığını, e, ne durumda olduğunu ve nereye varabileceğini konuşmak istiyoruz bu akşamki konuklarımızla. E, bu akşam e, bizimle e, Adisa Avdiç hocamız var. Ankara Yıldırım Beyaz Üniversitemizin Siyasal Bilgiler Fakültesi öğretim üyesi. Kendisi Bosna'dan ve barış yapımı, Batı Balkanlar ve iç savaş gibi konuları çalışmakta. Diğer taraftan Ebru Demir hocamız var hukuk fakültesinden. Kendisi de yine savaş sonrası hukuki sistemler üzerine çalışmakta. Ee, Adisa hocamız e, bu programın İngilizce olmasını arzu ettiler. E, Ebru hocam da e, tercihen e, o şekilde olabilir diye söylediği için biz programımızın e, geri kalanını e, İngilizce olarak yürüteceğiz. E, ben programımıza başlamadan önce e, e, herkese teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Vakit ayırdığınız için öncelikle sizlere, Ulise ekibine ve e, rektörümüz e, Sayın Profesör Doktor İbrahim Aydınlı hocamıza da her zaman e, üniversitemizdeki e, faaliyetlere e, katkısını esirgemiyor, e, zaman ayırıyor. E, nazik davetlerimizi kırmadıkları için ben kendilerine çok teşekkür ediyorum. E, vakitlerinin e, kısıtlı olduğunu biliyorum e, ve kendilerinden biz e, bir açılış konuşması e, arzu ettik, istirham ettik, kırmadılar. Çok sağ olsunlar. E, hocam e, açılış konuşması için e, mikrofon sizde. Buyurun çok teşekkür ederim. Evet herkese öncelikle hayırlı geceler diliyorum. Sesim geliyor e, zannedelim. Evet öncelikle e, yine Ulusan'ın gerçekten e, her ay her hafta böyle güzel sürprizlerle yeni konularla beni de heyecanlandırıyor doğrusu. E, takip ettiğim en sık e, sosyal medya olarak, Twitter olarak Ulusay'ı ben takip ediyorum. E, İbrahim hocamıza ben de gerçekten e, iki yıl içerisinde göstermiş olduğum performansdan dolayı kendisine çok çok teşekkür ediyorum. Aynı zamanda ekibi de bu anlamda gerçekten güzel çalışıyor. E, şimdi tabii biliyorsunuz bizler sosyal bilimci olarak, ben hukukçuyum, İbrahim hocamız iktisatçı, yine arkadaşlarımız uluslararası hukukta 
e, ve diğer e, arkadaşımıza tarih bölümünde. E, bizler sosyal bilimci olarak tabii asker değiliz. Bu anlamda güvenlik, savunma bunlar genelde teknik olarak e, askeri kesim e, tarafından e, biliyorsunuz teorisi üretiliyor, kurgulanıyor ve uygulanıyor. E, tabii e, savaş evet, mücadele, e, hak, hakkı savunma gerektiğinde bazen ilk hak, hak dediğimiz e, hak alma. Bunlar tabii e, değişik mücadele türleri. E, çatışma mücadele şeklinde e, tabii isimlendiriliyor. İşte son dönemlerde proksi dediğimiz vekalet savaşları da çok yoğunlaştı dünyada. Artık devletler doğrudan doğruya ordularını işte e, tam tekmir bir başka ülkenin içine kolay kolay sokmuyor. Farklı farklı metotlar uygulanıyor. <gülüyor> Aslında e, bugünkü konumuz e, Bosna Savaşı sonrası e, diye özetleyebileceğimiz e, bir mesele. Bosna'da neler oldu ve sonrası ne, e, ne, nelere yol açtı. E, geçen haftalarda Ebru e, ile biz e, hem bir konuları görüşelim hem de bazı hususlarda kendisiyle bir, e, bazı konuları e, karşılıklı bir konuşalım diye çağırmıştım. <gülüyor> Tabii e, Ebru'nun özellikle yurt dışında hazırlamış olduğu doktora tezi bizim çok ilgimiz çekti. İbrahim Hocam da biliyor. <gülüyor> Bosna Savaşı sonrası kurgulanan sistemler, özellikle tazminat kurulları, mahkemeler ki onların bazılarını bütün dünya izledi. Savaş suçları mahkemesi gibi. E, aynı şey şu anda e, tabii <gülüyor> Karabağ'da e, görülüyor. E, özellikle Doğu milletleri olarak biraz tabii kendimizi de eleştirelim ama e, eskisi gibi de değiliz. Savaştan sonra masada kaybettiğimiz birçok olay var. E, yani Türkler olarak iyi savaşırlar ama masada kaybederler diye. Bu kaybetmemizin neden aslında bizim e, bu, bunu becerememiz değil. Burada paradigmalar çok farklı. Yani Batı paradigması ya da işte e, bazen bu liberal paradigma olarak kendini gösteriyor, bazen sosyalist paradigma olarak kendini gösteriyor, bazen de kapital, kapitalist paradigma olarak kendini gösteriyor. Biz e, sözümüzde duran e, Paktosun Servan'da dediğimiz ahde vefa ilkesi ki bunlar uluslararası hukukta çok önemlidir. E, bütün bunlarla ilişkin aslında ee, bir asimetrik bir durumumuz var. Yani karşı taraf bunların ihlali üzerine kendisini kurgulamış, verdiği hiçbir sözü tutmamak üzere zaten e, hayatını düzgün, düzenlemiş, işte yalan söylemenin e, nasıl yapılabildiğini öğretirler bize diye. Pompeo'nun bir, güzel bir sözü vardı. CIA'ya nasıl adam yetiştirir böyle anlatmıştı. Biz nasıl daha çok yalan söyleyebiliriz, eğitimini aldık diye. E, Türklerde ise bu böyle değildir. E, daha doğrusu Burada tabii ki e, sizin de ilmi siyasetiniz vardır ama bizler bunu e, bir yerde bir yere kadar yaparız. Bir yerden sonra neyse o, o, o şekilde söyleriz. Aslında bizim kay, kaybettiğimiz e, meselelerde birçoğunun aklı bu yatıyor. Ama bugün e, geldiğimiz noktada artık Türkiye e, özellikle bu tür çatışma alanları sonrası neler yapılabileceğini, ne yapıldığında nelerin e, ortaya çık çıkacağını ya da ee, neler bırakıldığında, neler ihmal edildiğinde meselenin 5-10 yıl sonra e, nasıl e, aleyhimize döndüğünü e, artık görüyoruz. Ee, bunu özellikle pardon. Arkadaşlar bu arada e, kusura kalmayın. Birçok böyle mesajlar, telefonlar falan geliyor. Telefon sürekli titreşimde. Sesim geliyor mu? Tamam. E, dolayısıyla ben Özellikle bu e, Karabağ sonrası normalleşme diye e, yaptığımız, e, geçen haftalarda yaptığımız çalışmanın ne kadar değerli olduğunu gerçekten e, anla, anlamış bulunmaktayım. Özellikle Sabina'nın bize, Karabuğcu olan Sabina'nın, Sabina Hanım'ın bize e, yönlendirdiği bir teşekkür e, iletisi vardı biliyorsunuz. Onu biz sosyal medyada yayınladık. Biz de cevap verdik sağ olsun Yücel Acel Hocamız bize bu anlamda bir metin hazırladı. Çünkü bu uluslararası bir dil. Bu dili bilmek lazım. E, dolayısıyla burada üniversite olarak farkında olmadan aslında biz farkındayız ama tabii bunun etkisini sonra sonra e, fark ediyoruz. Aslında e, neyi e, temel aldığımızı ve hangi konu çalıştığımızda e, neyin ortaya çıkacağını daha iyi e, görüyoruz. Dolayısıyla e, ben bugün de bu konunun 
e, burada ele alınmasının özellikle Karabağ zaferi sonrası e, Bosna'da yaşanan tecrübelerin e, burada çok iyi irdelenip e, meselenin Karabağ'da nasıl aktarılacağını aslında e, merak ediyorum. E, her ne kadar coğrafyalar farklı olsa da aslında e, şunu hemen belirteyim, e, tabii konuşmacılar da bunu değinecek ama bu iki mesele birbiriyle o kadar bağlantılı ki çünkü e, her ikisi de bir Ortodoks Hristiyanlık var. E, bunlar 91-92 yılları gibi böyle ardışık e, şekilde gerçekleşti. Yani önce zannedersem e, Karabağ katliamı oldu, soykırım oldu. Arkasından Bosna e, oldu. Bosna'da katliam oldu veya soykırım oldu. Dolayısıyla bugün Yeni Şafak'ta da e, o günü e, şahit olan bir e, zannedersem e, bir e, Bosnalı siyasetçi hala karşı tarafın e, evet e, kötü bir katliamdı, kötü bir suçlu, vahşi bir cevap işlenmiş e, dedikçe o da bu bir soykurumdu diyor. Kap, katılmıyor buna. Halbuki bütün bunlar aslında e, uluslararası belgelere de girdi. Yani dolayısıyla e, iki, bir çifte standart görüyoruz dünyada. E, Müslümanlar olunca, e, özellikle Türk ve Müslüman da olunca e, böyle olaylara asla soykırım demedikleri e, halde e, biz e, örneğin işte Ermeni soykırımını sürekli Amerika'nın gündemine sokan bir rubi var. Dolayısıyla bundan sonraki süreçlerde artık akıllı olmamız, aklımızı kullanıp şimdiden hemen e, beklemeden bu süreçleri gerçekten hızlı bir şekilde uluslararası alana taşıyıp haklarımızı sıcağı sıcağına elde etmeye bakmalıyız diye ben düşünüyorum. E, bu kısa e, demeyelim ama biraz girizgah yapmış oldum herhalde. Ben öncelikle bu iki genç akademisyen arkadaşımızı gerçekten tebrik ediyorum. E, bundan sonra inşallah yine bu tür çalışmalarda e, beraber oluruz diyorum. Herkese hayırlı akşamlar Hayırlı akşamlar diliyorum. Sayın Rektörüm çok teşekkür ederim. E, vakit ayırdığınız için e, bu açılış e, konuşması için e, gerçekten e, Karabağ'la da e, ilintisini e, kurdunuz. Önemli bir nokta. E, çok teşekkür ederim. Ben sözü çok uzatmadan programımızın geri kalan kısmına geçmek istiyorum. Sanırım konuşmacılarımızın anlatmak istediği çok şey var. Daha önceki konuşmalarımızdan anladığım kadarıyla ona geçmek istiyorum. Tabii dediğim gibi İngilizce olacak. Ben konuşmacılarımızı İngilizce sunmak istiyorum. Neler yaptıklarını ve ne konuda konuşacaklarını. Evet. <gülüyor> Dear Mr. President and esteemed guests, uh, welcome to the Ulisa Institute's uh, panel webinar on the current crisis that is unfolding uh, in Bosnia currently. After some 26 years of frozen conflict period, the fault lines in Bosnia and Herzegovina has started to move again. The conflict arguably started with high representatives move to outlaw genocide denial. Uh, as uh, Mr. President mentioned, uh, many people are arguing that it wasn't a genocide, it was a crime, a uh, terrible crime. Um, then high representative moved to outlaw this, make this illegal and crime. Uh, then this conflict is reportedly started with that. Now the Serbian part in the conflict is demanding to withdraw from the joint structures of the uh, uh, Republic, which are uh, army, the judiciary, and the fiscal administration, or tax administration, which were three joint uh, entities uh, of uh, after Dayton uh, period. <clears throat> It is feared that uh, the conflict, the frozen conflict is going to fall rapidly. Uh, we don't know what's really happening. We don't know where it's going to end. There are some questions that we are going to seek answers tonight. Uh, the current development, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, uh, can be a result of 
uh, power struggle of the major uh, actors uh, in the conflict, like uh, Russia, the EU, and United States. Um, in order to understand what's really happening and how serious it can get and where it can end up, uh, we organized this event. I thank to Ulissa team for this event and for all of you for your time, for your participation tonight. Uh, we have two distinguished experts on the subject here with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Adisa Avdic Kusmush, a Bosnian national. Um, Dr. Avdic holds a PhD from Metropolitan University in Prague. She works and teaches in the Department of International Relations here at Ankara Yildirim Beyazut University. Her research interest areas are peace building and conflict resolution and Western Balkans. She also teaches civil war and internal conflict at my institute, the Institute of International Relations and Strategic Research, the host of this event tonight. Uh, Dr. Ab, uh, Dr. Avdic will discuss the current crisis and she's gonna link it to Dayton Agreement. She will also compare the secession of the Republika Srpska to the Kosovo case. She will briefly mention the role of other actors such as Russia, EU, US, and Turkey in the conflict. We also have Dr. Ebru Demir from the School of Law of Ankara Yildirim Beyazıt University. Uh, Dr. Ebru Demir is a lecturer. She works in the Department of International Law of School of Law of uh, Ankara Yildirim Beyazıt University. She holds a PhD in law from the University of Sussex and a master's degree from the University of <clears throat> excuse me, Nottingham's School of Law. She did her PhD on Bosnia. She examined the post-war justice mechanisms and discussed the extent to which they were successful in providing peace, justice, and reconciliation for Bosnia and Herzegovina. She's the right person. Both of our experts tonight are the right persons on this subject tonight. Dr. Demir will highlight the constitutional foundations of the current crisis and locate the tension on a broader context. She will also focus on the tripartite presidency model and the ethnicity issue in the constitution of Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'd like to start with Dr. Adisa Avdic Kusmush for her presentation. Uh, we're going to have one round of presentations. After the presentations have been finished, uh, we will have Q&A sessions. Uh, please welcome for your questions and um, you know discussions and remarks uh, if you'd like to. Um, all right, thank you very much, Dr. Aldic, for joining us tonight. Uh, please welcome for your speech. Thank you for this nice introduction. I would also like to thank everyone for joining this late uh, to discuss uh, Bosnia. I really appreciate it. Uh, I think it's important to organize this type of events uh, in order to increase the awareness of how serious the situation in Bosnia really is. Um, as uh, Dr. Demir mentioned, uh, so far it's been sort of a frozen conflict and uh, it's, some signs are showing that we might be on the verge of it becoming again a full-blown uh, conflict. Uh, and uh, my goal tonight is to somehow uh, present uh, the key points of what led to the current crisis and to understand the complexity of the situation uh, in Bosnia. So uh, let me just share the screen, share the slides so that uh, it will be easier to follow. Uh, so basically we will briefly mention the Dayton Peace Agreement because unfortunately this is something that, uh, something that uh, defines the current political system. And uh, according to many scholars, it's actually the root of the problem. It's the root uh, of the crisis that we're having. Uh, and uh, what I find quite interesting is that uh, you have these uh, conflicting, conflicting uh, calls to save the Dayton, 
and at the same time to reform the data or to somehow get rid of the data. Okay, so you have uh, because uh, everyone uh, agrees. Uh, the Dayton doesn't work, that the political system that was established by the Dayton Peace Agreement is extremely complex uh, and uh, is not fully functional. At the same time, uh, reforming this system uh, might be a very risky business. Uh, what's also quite peculiar in this case is that the constitution of the country is uh, also part of the uh, peace agreement. So uh, the, the uh, chapter four, of the Dayton Peace Agreement is the constitution uh, of the country, which means any attempt to make amendments to the constitution is sort of uh, uh, uh, playing with fire in the Bosnian context. Uh, so uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, unfortunately Balkans have this very bad uh, reputation of being the, the powder keg of Europe, a place which is always waiting to explode. Uh, there's always, uh, there's, it's always on the verge of conflict. Uh, and uh, even, even uh, many uh, politicians in the past uh, were describing the Balkans as, as just a, a place that's, uh, uh, that produces more history than it can consume. There's too much uh, happening. Uh, even Bismarck uh, said that uh, one day a great war will happen from some foolish things in the from some foolish thing in the Balkans. Uh, obviously, he was right. The First World War also started uh, was triggered uh, with the assassination in Sarajevo. Uh, and nowadays, why I'm mentioning this is that I I keep hearing this type of. Uh, uh, uh, questions it, like it might be another uh, another uh, uh, it might be leading to another great war which not only involves the local actors but involves many different parties because if you look at it historically the Balkans were always sort of a lands in between lands in between empires lands between different civilizations religions cultures uh, so until today uh, the situation uh, did not change much. So uh, in this sense, uh, uh, what happens in Balkans will affect not only the Balkans, it will affect uh, the EU, it will affect Turkey, it will affect many other uh, actors. So um, uh, that said, uh, I keep uh, receiving phone calls for the past two weeks asking me what's happening in Bosnia, is there going to be a war in Bosnia? Uh, and obviously the, question, the, the answer I can give is that I, I don't know, I hope not, I hope not. But uh, what I can say for sure is that the crisis we are facing uh, at this moment is the most serious crisis since the Dayton Peace Agreement was signed in 1995. So we should, uh, under no condition, uh, underestimate, underestimate uh, the importance of this crisis and the gravity uh, of this crisis. Uh, the, the photos that you see on the slide are take, were taken last week. It was uh, basically during uh, one of the two subsequent police force exercises of the entity of Republika Srpska. So you can see the actual like soldiers with uh, uh, basically, in this case, it's police officers or police officers, but there were tanks involved, there were uh, war helicopters involved. Uh, and the official explanation was that this was just for cases of emergency. OK, uh, but obviously the way that uh, U4 and uh, uh, NATO saw it as sort of a provocation or basically heightening the tensions to another level. OK, so um, basically last week also, I'm just trying to give you a context to where we are at now. Last week, uh, U4 actually extended its peace mission to, to Bosnia. We were hoping or basically there was hope that it would end uh, this year. Uh, however, uh, uh, the uh, peace operation and the presence of the EU force uh, has been extended for another year. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a very significant uh, presence in terms of numbers. We're talking about 600, troop of 600. Okay, so tr troop of uh, uh, 600 soldiers from 21 countries. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, there are currently some rumors that even some weapons are being distributed uh, to local communities around Bosnia, which creates a lot of anxiety, as you can imagine. Um, just uh, to as uh... Uh, sorry, özür dileriz. E, sabotaj olabiliyor. <gülüyor> e, Zoom toplantılarında e, biz tabii önlemlerimizi aldık ancak. Yine de e, e, maalesef 
e, sabotajı uğramış evet. e, bulunuyoruz. O yüzden arkadaşlarımız sunumu kaldırdılar. E, tekrar e, evet ekranda sunumumuz galiba. Geri alabilirsek. Okay. Uh, can you see the slides now? Yes. Biraz bekletebilir miyiz? Uh, I can continue talking without the slides. That's perfectly fine. So uh, I wanted to just uh, address the issue of the Dayton Agreement, uh, where uh, basically it's a, a, a, a, a, a agreement which is signed to end the war, but not really to build a state. So you might wonder, what is it? Why do we keep talking about the Dayton Agreement and what is so wrong with it? Uh, and I will try again sharing the, the screen. Uh, oh, I cannot. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, oh. Hold on for a second, let Thank me. Um... Mm -hmm. No, not yet. So basically what the system that was established by the Dayton Agreement created a complex system where the, the country consists of two separate entities uh, and uh, basically each of these entities uh, behaves or has the authority or characteristics of a, a mini state, okay, which means uh, basically they have their own ministries, even they have their own constitutions, basically a high degree of autonomy granted to individual entities. Uh, apart from that, one of the entities, Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, is divided into 10 separate cantons, and each of these cantons also has their own separate ministries. So you have many different layers uh, of power. Okay, that's why what makes it a very complex political uh, system. Uh, the, idea, the idea behind uh, establishing uh, this system was uh, basically trying to uh, uh, uh, impose sort of a consociationalist uh, a democracy, a system which uh, primarily depends uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, agreement or compromise between elites. Uh, obviously, you can imagine that in a post-war environment, uh, the, the compromise between elites that, uh, used to ju that just stopped uh, uh, fighting would be rather challenging and rather difficult. Uh, let me try again. Yes, yes please. You can share now. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so uh, the Bo Bosnian political system is sometimes described as the most complicated political system in Europe. Uh, on the slide, you can actually see uh, the map uh, and of the different layers uh, of power. So uh, as I said, it consists of two entities, 14 governments, 10 cantons, one condominium under international supervision and high representative, uh, which is both basically an appointed diplomat, which holds in some sense supreme power in the country. So let me just show you a map uh, to what I'm actually talking about. So here you have uh, the state of Bosnia and then uh, you, on the map you see the two entities, marked two entities, uh, which uh, basically uh, are uh, uh, occupying uh, op approximately 50% of the territory is one entity and 50% of the ter other territory is the other entity, Republika Srpska. So uh, you could think of it in this way, that just to simplify how you can imagine what was being signed at Dayton, is that uh, the Dayton agreement was basically a process of assigning land to one of the entities. So for example, uh, uh, let's say the city of Tuzla would be assigned to the Federation, city of Vienna would be assigned to Republika Srpska. And this was done basically on a principle that would uh, uh, somehow depict the situation, the green area that you see on the map. Uh, so basically in the north, the green part on the map, the, the, the condominium uh, under international supervision, uh, where basically, uh, if we are looking at the current crisis, and if you would be asking me what is the hot spot, where is it most likely that the conflict might start, uh, I would mark uh, this this city and this place. Uh, okay, I'm not able to show uh, share the screen again. So basically, 
I would mark this particular city as a, a place where the conflict is most likely uh, to start uh, simply because it's because of its very important strategic position. Uh, basically, it cuts Republika Srpska, okay, the entity that is trying to secede, into two halves. So basically, in order to, per, to, to, uh, to have the territorial integrity of Republika Srpska, it is absolutely necessary for the Serb leadership to take over Brčko, to take over uh, that uh, area. So uh, this is why uh, it's the most likely hotspot uh, at the moment. Okay, so I would, I would keep an eye on that particular, particular uh, uh, part. Uh, in this sense, uh, we could uh, discuss also uh, the office of the high representative and who the high representative is, what is his role uh, in Bosnia. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, uh, when the Dayton Agreement was signed, uh, a new office was uh, opened uh, as sort of an international body that would oversee the implementation of the Dayton Agreement. Uh, and the, uh, the head of this uh, office of the high representative uh, would be a European diplomat uh, who would be appointed by the Peace Implementation Council. So I want to underline that high representative is not elected by the people or the citizens of Bosnia. It is someone that is appointed by the international community, or in this sense, uh, the Peace Implementation Council. Uh, the, uh, the level and the, um, uh, the scope of the powers that he was granted uh, is, quite, uh, uh, is quite significant because uh, he was uh, uh, granted uh, power to uh, change any laws or to impose any laws. Uh, so regardless of the local uh, parliaments, regardless of the local uh, politicians, uh, the high representative could actually impose laws. Uh, at the same time, uh, he could ban political parties or he could uh, uh, basically uh, ban any uh, politician or basically uh, uh, uh, take over uh, his uh, or cancel his uh, role in parliament or in politics. So basically he could ban, ban, ban their participation in the political life. Uh, of Bosnia. So in this sense, uh, it's important uh, to realize that uh, for Bosnia, sorry, I was trying again to share the screen. Yes. We were not expecting to face this situation. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, here we are with the high representative. Uh, Can you see the slide? Sorry, I have to check. No, yes, yes, we can. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, he could actually impose any laws uh, and uh, uh, make any uh, political decisions apart or basically uh, even against the will of the, the locals. Uh, so uh, in this sense, Bosnia is sometimes described as a protectorate or as a colony uh, of the international uh, community uh, because of such high, uh, such a level of involvement uh, of uh, international uh, actors. Okay, so uh, basically having, having the background uh, of the, the complexity of the system, uh, what happened in July this year is that the high representative, and at the time it was an Austrian diplomat, Valentin Insko, decided to impose a law banning genocide denial. In this case, uh, important is to uh, emphasize that we talk about Srebrenica genocide. Okay, so uh, uh, uh, International Court of Justice uh, declared the crimes that happened uh, in Srebrenica that they constitute under international law, they are genocide. Uh, other, uh, other crimes, other uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes uh, in other areas in Bosnia uh, do not have uh, the same uh, uh, uh, uh, label, were not recognized as genocide, but when we talk about genocide in Srebrenica, it is something which has been confirmed by the International Court of Justice. Uh, uh, for many years, uh, the top officials uh, in Republika Srpska 
have actually uh, uh, joined this sort of a, a cult of personality uh, or built a cult of personality of war criminals, where basically they glorify uh, war criminals uh, as national heroes and uh, basically deny that genocide happened. Uh, some more uh, extreme versions uh, actually claim that it was the Bosniaks themselves that uh, uh, basically faked the genocide. Uh, to somehow uh, uh, to somehow force the uh, to uh, force uh, the U.S. to react and to uh, sign the uh, the Dayton Agreement. So uh, in this sense, uh, uh, following this decision, following the ban on genocide denial, uh, the leader of the Bosnian Serbs, Milorad Dodik, and he is the, also the current member of the presidency, the Serb member of presidency. Uh, basically uh, decided that he would push for the secession of Republika Srpska. So let's repeat, uh, I will go back to the map. So the situation we are witnessing now, where we are at this point, is that we have the two entities and the pink entity that we see on the map, Republika Srpska, is planning to uh, claim self-determination and secede. Okay, so uh, this is the planned secession of basically 50, includes 50% 50 of the territory of Bosnia. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the first step towards uh, this uh, becoming a reality uh, was uh, the decision to withdraw from three, cre uh, from, uh, three key, uh, key state institutions, uh, basically the armed forces, uh, uh, the, the top judiciary bo bodies, and from the tax administration uh, system, and Milorad Dodik uh, basically claimed that uh, these institutions would be replaced by Serb-only institutions. Uh, you might wonder how might you put this in practice? How can this actually happen? Uh, and the same question was asked to Milorad Dodik. Uh, and the answer that he gave was quite friend frightening because uh, he actually said that uh, uh, he would uh, do the same thing that the Slovenians did. Uh, in 1992, which means they would use force. He would uh, actually use force uh, to somehow uh, uh, make uh, the Bosniaks uh, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in these bodies withdraw. Okay, so this was basically an open threat uh, with violence or using force. Uh, and uh, this uh, led to further escalation uh, of tensions uh, in Bosnia. Uh, you might also wonder, uh, like if you, we go back again to the map, uh, uh, it's a very small area. Uh, here it was compared to Sicily, the size of Sicily. Okay, the population is about 1.2 million people. Okay, so really, really small. So uh, you might actually wonder where Delvik gets his courage right, to, to, to uh, speak about secession, speak about conflict, fighting, because uh, it's very clear that NATO, uh, the US and uh, EU uh, states like Turkey as well are clearly uh, on the side of protecting the territorial integrity of Bosnia. So you might wonder where does he get uh, the support? Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, uh, uh, is becoming uh, uh, more evident that, uh, that Russia, uh, Russia is uh, actively supporting uh, Serbs in this regard, uh, and that this is the reason why uh, where, where this is uh, actually where they get uh, the courage, and this is where they um, uh, start uh, uh, what they base uh, what uh, the the thing that they base the secession claims uh, on. Okay, uh, so basically. Uh, I want to discuss for a moment uh, uh, this uh, past few weeks, the past two weeks have been quite intense in terms of diplomatic activities. Uh, and uh, you could see a high, uh, uh, uh, uh, high ranking officials uh, visiting Bosnia. Uh, for example, uh, this week, uh, the US envoy for the Western Balkans, which was appo uh, appointed by President Biden had arrived to Bosnia for a meeting with uh, the representatives of the three uh, uh, uh, groups. Uh, and uh, basically the outcome of this meeting was, uh, I mean, he, uh, the, the, the statement he gave was, there will be no war. Uh, 
but there was really no further explanation to what is going to happen or what was agreed. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, basically, he claimed that the U.S. will impose sanctions or can impose sanctions on Dodik unless he, he uh, backs up or he softens the rhetoric that they might impose sanctions on Dodik. Uh, at the same time, uh, just yesterday, Dodik uh, visited Ankara and he had a meeting with uh, the President Erdogan. Uh, there was a very brief statement following uh, this meeting uh, where uh, he, uh, it was described, Turkey was described as a country which uh, uh, works, uh, uh, which works, uh, or basically which aims at protecting the peace uh, in Bosnia and uh, a country which has historically always supported the peace process uh, and has been one of the guarantors of the peace in Bosnia. Uh, and uh, Dodi gave a statement of how much he respects the Turkish president and Turkey as an, uh, and uh, Turkey as a country or as a great country, as he said. Uh, but uh, basically, it's still not clear uh, what uh, what was actually agreed or if any actual steps had been agreed during these uh, meetings. Uh, so so far, uh, NATO uh, and uh, basically the U.S have uh, uh, said that they, uh, they are uh, ready for any scenario in Bosnia uh, and uh, that uh, uh, they would protect the Dayton agreement or the Dayton peace agreement and territorial integrity uh, of Bosnia uh, at any cost. So uh, at this point, this is, this is where we are uh, now. Uh, and uh, I wanted to just uh, maybe uh, compare it uh, again, going back uh, to the map, because I think map is uh, is is uh, very it's very important to uh, to know what region we are actually discussing, because Republika Srpska, so the eastern part of Republika Srpska, are bordering uh, Serbia. Uh, the assumption is that uh, after uh, seceding or after declaring uh, independence, uh, the next scenario would be that uh, this area would uh, uh, uh, become united with Serbia. So somehow making uh, the dream of a uh, great uh, Serbia uh, come true. Um, okay, uh, Ibrahim, am I? Uh, uh, my time is up. I'm afraid, or should well, I? You're good. You're good. If you have like a couple other remarks to make, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, one one thing that one thing that's often said, uh, and you could also read it in the newspaper, and I actually heard it amongst the people as well when they were discussing the situation in Bosnia, and uh, and Republika Srpska's uh, claims uh, to independence. They say, well, if Kosovo could declare independence, then I guess uh, they should also be able to declare independence because what is the difference? So the thing I want to underline. Uh, tonight is that there is a very significant difference between the situation in Kosovo and the conditions that were found in Kosovo before declaring independence and the situation in Republika Srpska now. If you look at the secession conditions, uh, you know that uh, under international law we have two principles. One, the principle of territorial integrity, which is always and always above the principle of self-determination. Right, so there is a principle of self-determination, but uh, territorial integrity always uh, uh, is above uh, the right to secede. Uh, only under very special circumstances can an entity declare independence and secede from territory, especially if it's not with consent uh, of uh, the other actor involved. Uh, so uh, I wanna just uh, uh, uh, mention three main conditions for uh, a legal secession under international law. Uh, one is that secessionists are a people in an ethnographic sense. You could argue this, that, that there is similarity between Kosovo Albanians and Serbs in this case, uh, because even uh, uh, Kosovo Albanians had difficulty of proving that they were a separate ethnic group comparing to the Albanians in Albania, right? Uh, so Serbs in Bosnia or Serbs in Serbia, are they two different ethnic groups? Uh, in this sense, when uh, the issue of Kosovo went to the International Court of Justice, it was uh, ruled that uh, the people can also represent not only a complete ethnic nation, but it can be used to refer 
to a homogenous ethnic enclave within another nation. Okay, so even though there is already a state of Albania in case of Kosovo, uh, Kosovo Albanians can be considered a separate homogenous ethnic enclave. So in this sense, uh, uh, you could claim that uh, Republika Srpska actually fulfills the first condition because it's following the conflict uh, and following the campaign of ethnic cleansing uh, in those areas of Bosnia, it is a homogeneous enclave inhabited mostly by Serb population. Okay, so in, in the sense of the first condition, you could claim that Republika Srpska is inhabited mostly by uh, ethnic Serbs uh, and that it is a separate homogeneous enclave within another state. However, the other two conditions uh, that uh, basically the state from which they're seceding is violating their human rights, which was the case of Kosovo Albanians, uh, and uh, that there are no other remedies, or basically that we tried all the other options, uh, basically are not true for Republika Srpska. Uh, uh, important to emphasize here is actually that uh, uh, in order to even recognizing the right to secede, would be an act of rewarding ethnic cleansing or rewarding uh, genocide, okay? Because uh, it's not that uh, uh, in this sense, uh, um, uh, violation of human rights in this sense uh, happened during the war. And at this time, it is an ethnically, uh, uh, ethnically homogenous uh, region, uh, but we cannot discuss uh, in any way violation of human rights or, uh, or basically the oppression of the citizens of Republika Srpska in the same way that we discussed uh, in Kosovo. Um, uh, in 2010, uh, basically the Court of Justice declared that, uh, the, that Kosovo was the creation of independence was in accordance with international law. It did not violate international law. However, in order to avoid this becoming a very dangerous precedent because you know that we have numerous other regions that uh, are uh, basically uh, claiming self-determination uh, or that would want to secede. So for example, uh, Abkhazia or uh, uh, Ossetia or you have Transnistria in Moldova or Catalonia or many other examples that might want to use Kosovo as a precedent, as something, as an example to follow. Uh, in case of the this court ruling, they made it very clear that Kosovo is a unique case uh, and that the conditions found in Kosovo are not found in any other case. So uh, basically saying uh, this is not, uh, this, this same uh, uh, rules or the same uh, conditions are not found anywhere else <clears throat> and this is not a precedent to follow. Uh, basically, uh, what's important to notice here, and uh, one of the main arguments, is that Kosovo was under international administration since NATO bombing in 1999. So since the Operation Allied Force in 1999, Kosovo has been placed under international supervision, direct international supervision. It wasn't administered by Serbia. And this was something that, that happened the first time. Uh, in, in international practice. So a rather unique case, something similar later was uh, implemented in, in Timor, East Timor, but Kosovo in this regard is a very unique case. Uh, also, uh, uh, the second uh, uh, uh, reason is that there was history of ethnic cleansing and crimes against civilians in Kosovo. Okay, so this is, this is again, not the case in uh, Republika Srpska. Uh, so, um, uh, the, maybe the, the final note I wanted to make is that uh, we should, uh, I'm, uh, there are discussions of possibility of uh, basically trading off Republika Srpska for Kosovo in a way that, uh, yes, Serbia will lose Kosovo, but it will gain Republika Srpska. Uh, and that this, this type of appeasement, like trying to avoid the war and sacrifice the territorial integrity of Bosnia, uh, I hope that this is not the path that uh, the international uh, uh, uh, community chooses because uh, we have witnessed uh, the policy of appeasement before and we know that it only led to more aggression and to more violence uh, and I'm hoping that this is not the path that uh, they will choose uh, this time. 
uh, I will be very happy to uh, uh, answer any questions you might have or anything else that I might have uh, left out during the presentation. Uh, and also, uh, I was a bit distracted with this, uh, with uh, uh, the sabotage or what was happening. So uh, I apologize. Uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me after uh, Ebru Hoca's uh, presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kusmish, for your uh, uh, remarks and explanations. Uh, they were uh, really detailed and uh, explaining uh, what's going on uh, in the conflict. I apologize for the uh, sabotage. Uh, apparently, one of our uh, uh, guests' uh, Zoom account has been hacked, actually, that uh, the mm -hmm. uh, sabotage was coming from a hacked account. Uh, and then we lock the participation now, and uh, we lock the chat uh, discussions, so no one can come and uh, use the chat. Uh, so we are here together only with fixed amount of uh, people. If you have questions, I have... Uh, a hand uh, raised, uh, Ramazan Erjan Bey. Uh, please uh, keep your questions uh, after the presentations. Uh, we're going to collect them at the end if it is possible. So um, now the time is for uh, Dr. Demir's uh, presentation. Uh, she's going to uh, explain uh, the conflict, what's happening uh, with its constitutional roots, uh, right? Uh, Dr. Demir, uh, the stage is yours, please. Uh, so are you able to see? Uh, yes, my... yes. Okay, perfect. We, we can hear you and perfect. we see the presentation. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank their Ibrahim Demir Hoca and Ulissa for their uh, kind invitation and very kind introduction as well. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, it is also a pleasure to be in the same panel with Adisa. Uh, I have learned a lot from her presentation and this has been very informative and fruitful panel for me already. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, today, I will look at the issues Adisa mentioned. So I think our presentations are gonna complement each other. Uh, so I'm going to look at the issues Adissa mentioned from more like a legal perspective. In my presentation, I will discuss the underlying reasons uh, of the ongoing political tension. I will ask what are the root causes of today's political tension? And what are the underlying causes, reasons for the ongoing events? And my quick answer will be the constitution of Bosnia-Herzegovina. I will highlight the constitutional foundations of the crisis, current crisis, and locate the tension uh, on a context. Bosnia's constitution is one of the most complicated constitutions, uh, as Adisa underlined. Um, it is, Dayton is the peace treaty and the current constitution of Bosnia-Herzegovina is annexed to this peace treaty. So the Dayton and the constitution of Bosnia-Herzegovina are known for their complicated nature. In addition to being this complicatedness, Dayton is also known for being an uh, unsuccessful peace agreement. What do I mean by that? I mean the Dayton peace agreement, uh, which includes the constitution of Bosnia-Herzegovina, is actually a peace agreement which sharpens the ethnic identities uh, and ethnic rivalries in the country. So for people who already know about the context in Bosnia and for people who already know about Dayton, the current events are not actually so surprising. Because since the signing of the peace treaty, there were always criticisms by scholars, uh, activists, lawyers, that this peace treaty actually would fail at some point. Nobody knew when it would happen, but as I said, those who know a bit about the context, a bit about the constitution, have doubts that this peace treaty would survive for a long time. So after this brief introduction, I would like to focus on the issues with the constitution of Bos Bosnia-Herzegovina in my presentation in order to better understand what is happening today. 
there are many problematic areas in the constitution, uh, but it is of course impossible to just uh, mention or discuss all of these issues in, in 15 minutes presentation. So uh, I will focus only on the tripartite presidency model uh, and the ethnicity issue in the constitution of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, first of all, let's look at the ethnicity issue in the Bosnia's constitution. So according to the constitution of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Bosniaks, Croats, and Serbs are constituent peoples uh, of Bosnia-Herzegovina. So the constitution recognizes all three ethnicities involved in the war. Uh, so the idea was, while writing uh, Dayton, the idea was if we recognize all the ethnicities involved in the war, then there will be no issues or conflicts in the future again. However, it should be noted that Bosnia is a very multinational uh, country. Uh, other than having uh, Bosniaks, Croats and Serbs, there are other ethnicities living in the country for centuries such as Roma people or Jewish communities. Another issue regarding the ethnicity appears when it comes to the presidency system in Bosnia-Herzegovina. According to the constitution of Bosnia-Herzegovina, the presidency of Bosnia-Herzegovina shall consist of three members, one Bosniak and one Croat, each directly elected from the territory of the Federation, and one Serb directly elected from the territory of the Republika Srpska. So, as you know, there are the current, uh, these are the current presidents of Bosnia Herzegovina. So, Shefik Jaferovic is the Bosniak representative of the presidency. Uh, Jelko Komšić is the Croat representative of the presidency. And Milorad Dodik uh, is the Serb representative of the presidency. Jelko Komšić is the chairperson of the presidency now. What is chairperson? Uh, one of the, these three presidents, all of them are presidents equally, but one of them becomes a chairperson in a rotation during the four-year term. Uh, so every eight months, uh, Adis also mentioned, the chairperson changes. And as you know, Milorad Dodik, who is the one threatening to separate at the moment, uh, he was the chairperson until very recently, until uh, July. So there has been so many criticisms for this presidency system. First of all, uh, I would like to mention a case which actually went to the European Court of Human Rights regarding this tripartite presidency model. The case is Sadich and Finci case. Uh, Dervo Sadich uh, is Roma and Jacob Finci is Jewish and both uh, living in Bosnia-Herzegovina. They both wanted to stand for election for the presidency. Uh, however, they were denied to stand for election because of their ethnic origins. Uh, as I said, only the constituent people of Bosnia-Herzegovina are able to run for the presidency elections according to the constitution. So only Bosniaks, Croats and Serbs can run for the elections. Uh, after uh, Finci and Sadic uh, exhaust all the domestic legal remedies, in 2006, they uh, went to the European Court of Human Rights and claimed that the constitution of Bos Bosnia-Herzegovina was discriminatory. Sadic and Finci argued that only because of their ethnic origins, they were not able to become candidates for the presidency. They claim that under the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 14, this means a violation of prohibition of discrimination. Taken together with Article 3 of Protocol Number 1, right to free elections, as well as Article 1 of Protocol Number 12, general prohibition of discrimination. The European Court of Human Rights found Sadic and Finci's arguments fair and concluded that the constitution of Bosnia-Herzegovina is a discriminatory constitution, which is in fact discriminating the citizens on the grounds of their ethnic origins and preventing them from enjoying their rights uh, to be elected and to elect. The case is important um, on many grounds. First of all, uh, in my opinion, it is a very important and very interesting case 
because an international human rights court, European Court of Human Rights, found a state's constitution discriminatory. It is a very interesting case, even just because of this. Why else uh, is this the case important? The case is also showing us that tripartite model of presidency is actually discriminatory and highlighting and sharpening the ethnic origins of the citizens. Dayton and the constitution of Bosnia formally institutionalize ethnic divisions which are applied in the political sphere and thus uh, applied in everyday life. In the constitution, Bosniaks, Croats, and Serbs are mentioned, but there is no Bosnian people in the document. So the constitution fragments Bosnia and Herzegovina through ethnic lines and creates ethnocentric uh, citizenship model. After wars, uh, but especially after ethnic-based uh, wars, it is so significant to decide how we are going to deal with the ethnicity issue in the constitution. Countries might go different directions. Uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina's constitution is highlighting the ethnicities and appointing the presidents and even low-level bureaucrats. Uh, we were discussing with Adisa how even low-level bureaucrats are elected on the basis of, on the basis of their uh, ethnicity. Um, in different post-war countries, such as Rwanda, ethnicity was made completely invisible after the war. So there are different ways to tackle the issue of ethnicity. As I said, states try uh, different ways. They try different methods. Uh, just to compare with Rwanda, as you know, in the 1990s, like uh, Bosnia, there was also a genocide against Tutsis by Hutus. Um, and after the war, both ethnicities, Hutus and Tutsis ethnicities, were made invisible. So from the identity cards, for instance, um, these ethnic origins were deleted and a Rwandan identity uh, has been trying to be established during the post-war period. Um, it is open to debate if Rwanda achieved reconciliation through this model. Uh, and there are actually so many scholars arguing the opposite and saying that this model also didn't work and Rwanda didn't achieve justice, peace or reconciliation after the war. Um, what I'm trying to say is that the experiences of Bosnia and Rwanda are showing us that highlighting and sharpening the ethnicities is not working as seen in Bosnia but also erasing all the ethnic uh, identities completely is not also working as seen in Rwanda. Um, I should also note that uh, Bosnia is called frozen conflict by scholars, right? So it is claimed that Dayton peace agreement did not bring peace, uh, but only froze the conflict. Um, perhaps we should also mention this fragmentation uh, from the perspective of education, for instance. I think it's a good example. Um, there's a system called uh, two schools under one roof uh, system. And students from different ethnicities in the same school learn different things. Uh, their curriculums are different uh, and they learn from a different version of truth uh, about what happened during the war. Every, uh, so there is that possibility that every ethnicity is teaching their students their own victimhood uh, in history classes. So there is not a shared truth regarding what happened in the 1990s uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So what does work then? Uh, I talked about what does not work, but what does work? In my opinion, acknowledging what happened is, is, is the crucial uh, key. Who did what to whom um, is an important question to be answered in post-war countries. Um, thus, as happened and happens in, in Bosnia without an acknowledgement of, of what happened, uh, acknowledge, without an acknowledgement of the genocide by Republika Srpska, um, there will not be a way forward. Uh, 
I would like to also underline my view on the high representatives law Adisa uh, mentioned uh, in detail. Uh, I think in, in post-war countries, in post-war context, top-down enforcements do not work in, in, in practice. Uh, previous high representative Valentin Insko, uh, by issuing a law uh, which bans the denial of the genocide is actually not going, doing something good uh, in this case, because these kinds of acknowledgements should come uh, bottom up, not top down. Um, what the high representative did actually triggered the ethno-nationalist policies as we see by using his bomb powers and gave leaders like Dodik uh, an excuse to implement and actually threaten uh, the ethno-nationalist policies. And also from international perspective, um, as you know, one of the fundamental principle, principles in international law is sovereign equality of states. So this means every state is equally sovereign uh, in the international community. So you cannot enforce such laws to, for instance, uh, great powers like, for instance, permanent five members of the Security Council, uh, who are some of them also accused of some war crimes around the world. Uh, so how and why would an appointed uh, high representative can enforce Bosnia uh, to such laws? So sever sovereignty principle is also uh, somehow uh, endangered in this incident. And as Adissa underlined, international court decisions telling us that genocide happened. Uh, there are International Criminal Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia, ICTY, and also International Court of Justice, ICJ, decisions uh, on Srebrenica genocide. Uh, but also, yeah, there are uh, individuals and still there are individuals and public authorities deny the genocide. Uh, because of the reasons I mentioned, uh, enforcing such laws top down, uh, I believe will only work against their own purposes in the long run, in my opinion. So I would like to end my presentation here and I would like to thank you all for listening and any comment or question is welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Demir. Uh, for your uh, presentation. Uh, what we see is a, a quite difficult situation uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, in terms of the history and the current situation. Um, um, so uh, I think the floor is open for uh, questions. We had a question from Ramazan Erjan, but we had to postpone. Now we can take it, uh, Ramazan Erjan. <laughs> Uh, sir, thank you uh, for the kind invitation, invitation for the uh, seminar. I also uh, thank all the presenters uh, for their comprehensive uh, presentations. Uh, my question uh, goes to uh, Madam Avdic. Uh, Madam, uh, you said that one of the countries who actively uh, support the secession of the Bosnia-Herzegovina is Hungary with Russian Federation and Serbia. What is the interest of Hung Hungary of this event? Thank you. Thank you, Ramazan, for this interesting question. I was hoping someone would ask because I didn't really have the time to explain uh, that part. Uh, and uh, it is quite interesting. Uh, the sort of uh, uh, friendship that is built between uh, Milora Dodik and Viktor Orban, uh, but it's not so unexpected and it's not so strange if you know the context of Hungarian domestic politics, right? Uh, so uh, uh, the, the, type of, uh, the type of ideology and the type of uh, nationalist populist uh, movement which is getting stronger uh, around Central Europe and where uh, Viktor Orban actually plays an important role. And he's at the moment uh, a person that is at odds with the EU uh, for uh, praising the so-called illiberal democracy model, right? So illiberal democracy model uh, where he praises Russia as, uh, as a perfect example of a country that can have regular elections. So in this way, be a democracy, 
having regular elections, but at the same time uh, does not really endorse the liberal values such as good governance and uh, uh, let's say a uh, rule of law or not necessarily the liberal values are uh, promoted, right? Uh, in this sense, uh, he finds, he finds a, a sort of a, a, a, good, a, a, a good companion uh, in Milorad Dodik. Um, what might be also interesting here is to make the comparisons between uh, the province of Vojvodina in Serbia, where significant Hungarian minority uh, lives, yeah. and which during Yugoslav times had the same status with Kosovo. So Vojvodina and Kosovo were both uh, autonomous provinces of Yugoslavia, had the same status, uh, and there might be, there might be some uh, interest uh, there as well. Uh, what's known for now is that Milor Dodik has uh, uh, visited uh, Hungary, uh, and they, it, they were, there was insta uh, intense diplomatic activity in this regard, uh, and uh, uh, supposedly that some promises were made uh, of support in case of any uh, any uh, insurgents in, in Bosnia. Okay, I hope okay. this at least gives okay. a bit more context. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions, any comments? from the audience, please. I think there is none, right? Um, dear guests, um, we are at the end of our uh, webinar tonight. Uh, uh, we thank uh, both of our uh, presenters, uh, they, uh, really explained the issue in detail and um, showed us uh, how serious the situation uh, is. Um, um, well, um, I think the lesson, we, we think that the uh, lesson was learned uh, some 25, 26 years ago, uh, but apparently, uh, what Dr. Audi showed us, like in terms of the pictures, uh, showing just some sort of preparation for a bigger uh, occasion, uh, that the lesson uh, has not been learned. Maybe, unfortunately, um, uh, during the pandemic and all other economic uh, uh, issues that the the, the world has, uh, right. Uh, I think this is the last thing that uh, we want to see, uh, a bloodshed uh, in the Balkans. Um, uh, I hope that the parties uh, will come to, uh, you know, peace uh, and ease with the conflict, uh, listen to each other, and uh, think about the lessons learned, and then... Uh, um, move in that direction that will uh, give time to healing and respect and living together kind of culture. Um, uh, although it's going to be difficult, uh, I hope I hope for the best. You know, um, for the for the people in the area and for all of the uh, relevant countries and bodies uh, internationally. Uh, with these thoughts, uh, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for your times for being with us tonight uh, in this event. Uh, and I, again, thank to our presenters. And I'd like to see you again uh, with our, in our next uh, event uh, or events. Uh, the next event is going to be on energy and uh, uh, food supply globally. Um, as I mentioned, the economic and economic issues and the pandemic. Um, so uh, have a good night, all of you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to see you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.